Tonight, Iran and the UAE join forces with BRICS, while Saudi Arabia considers the move. And Head of Parliament of World Religions confirms that the Indian government tried to influence its decision to remove a far-right Hindu speaker. We cover stories about the alleged mistreatment of foreign temporary workers in an Ontario farm, the surprise death of Wagner's chief, and six years since the Rohingya exodus as the world watches in silence. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. This is Muslim News Canada on Muslim Network TV. I'm Catherine Bullock. BRICS leaders have announced the admission of six new countries from next year. The club is seeking to reshape the Western-led global order and expand its geopolitical influence. The BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, have agreed at their annual summit to make Argentina, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates full members from January 1st. Chinese President Xi Jinping hails the admission as historic. China is the most powerful in the group of large and populous non-Western economies. In Iran, a senior presidential official described the move as a strategic success for Tehran's foreign policy. While the announcement indicated all six countries would join, the Saudi response today was non-committal. The Saudi foreign minister told local media that the kingdom was awaiting details about the invitation and would take the appropriate decision. Nearly two dozen countries had formally applied to join, and about the same number have expressed interest in joining BRICS. Founded in 2009 and expanded the following year to include South Africa, the BRICS has risen to prominence at a time of intense geopolitical rivalry. Analysts had predicted that this 15th summit could be pivotal. BRICS leaders championed its new BRICS leaders championed its new development bank as a fairer lender for emerging economies than the US-based institutions like the World Bank. They advocated that local currencies replace the US dollar in trade among its members. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says an overhaul of the world's dysfunctional and unfair global financial system is necessary, but it won't happen overnight. Reports show that the Indian government has made efforts to exert pressure on a global interfaith conference to reinstate a Hindu leader who had been removed due to her association with the Hindu far right. An email obtained by news outlet Middle East Eye reveals that the Indian consulate in Chicago urged the organisers of the Parliament of World Religions to reconsider their decision to remove Navidita Bidi, vice president of a Hindu far right organisation from the event's speaking lineup. Bidi had been initially featured as a speaker on the Parliament of the World's Religions website but her name was removed just before she was scheduled to address a plenary session on August 14th. This was in response to revelations that she frequently shared Islamophobic content on social media and participated in events organized by far-right groups. On the day Bidi was supposed to speak, the Indian Consul General in Chicago emailed the Parliament of World Religions organizers. His email questioned whether there were any legal or deeply objectionable associations Bidi might have had. He asked them to allow Bidi to speak. The chair of the Parliament of World Religions has confirmed receiving the email from the Indian consulate, but has declined to comment further. Rohit Chopra, a professor of communications at Santa Clara University, calls the intervention of the Indian government on behalf of an individual who is neither an official nor a diplomat, quote, unprecedented. He links this intervention with Bidi's Hindu nationalist views. Chopra says there is a visible trend where academics and activists who critique Indian policies face tracking, harassment and intimidation. Despite Bidi's removal from the conference, the Coalition of Hindus of North America, known for its affiliations with far-right Hindu groups, was allowed to host an event. The coalition has been accused of supporting India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party and targeting those who criticise Hindu nationalism. In Greece's Dardia forest, 18 individuals believed to be migrants or refugees were tragically found dead amidst a raging wildfire. The fire has been sweeping through the northeastern Greek region near the Turkish border for four days. The region is a crucial crossing point 
for migrants and refugees. The remains were discovered near a shack in Alexandropolis, a city in Greece's Evros region. Greece's migration minister, Dimitris Karadisi, has expressed sadness and condemned criminal traffickers who endanger migrants' lives. Two others were killed in the fires this week, bringing the death toll to at least 20 in Greece. Despite reduced migration from Turkey, Greece remains a remote migration frontline. The eastern Mediterranean route saw over 17,000 people attempting to cross this year, mainly from conflict areas. The Hellenic Fire Service is investigating the possibility the deceased entered illegally, as no missing persons were reported. Jamaican migrant workers have been sent back home from an Ontario farm after a one-day strike protesting poor working conditions, prompting the Canadian government to investigate. These workers had arrived in Canada in spring and were scheduled to stay until the fall, but were sent back on August 8th, much earlier than planned. The Canadian government says it has zero tolerance for mistreatment of temporary foreign workers. Jamaica's Labour Minister says it is examining the situation. The investigation shows crop challenges, which is a common reason for early contract termination. Video shared on TikTok earlier revealed substandard living conditions, leading to investigations by both governments. One video depicted flooded toilets overflowing into a bunkhouse kitchen, while another showed an apparent owner berating a worker for sewage issues. A Jamaican man's death last year while operating farm equipment sparked calls for better migrant worker rights and safety. The Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, active since 1966, recruits farmers from Jamaica and other nations for eight-month terms. The Jamaican government received no formal complaints. The Justice for Migrant Workers organization here claims the repatriation and hiring of new workers were efforts to suppress dissent. Despite challenging conditions, some workers are staying to support their families back home. Activists are demanding improved protections and permanent immigration status for these vulnerable workers. For more on the protests by Italian beachgoers on discrimination against Muslim women, stay tuned. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his country was not involved in Wednesday's plane crash in Russia's Tavir region that, that killed Wagner mercenary head Yevgeny Prigozhin. Nine other people on board also died. Addressing a news conference in the capital, Kyiv, Zelensky said Ukraine had nothing to do with the incident. He said, quote, I think everyone is aware of who is involved. Russia's Federal Air Transport Agency confirmed yesterday that an Embraer 135 aircraft crashed in the Tavir region while traveling from Moscow to St. Petersburg. The agency later released a list of the names of individuals aboard the craft, which included Prigozhin and Wagner co-founder Dmitry Utkin and other Wagner personnel. Three crew members also died. Investigations into the incident were launched by the agency. Russia's investigative committee said in a statement on Telegram that it initiated a criminal case on grounds of the violation of traffic safety rules and operation of air transport. Prigozhin made headlines in June when he launched an armed rebellion against the Russian leadership. He quickly aborted it after a deal brokered by the Belarusian president. More than 50 women, along with a handful of men, have, have participated in a unique demonstration at a beach club in Trieste, in northern Italy. The event last Sunday aimed to show solidarity with Muslim women who had faced criticism the previous Sunday for wearing burkinis, a type of full-body swimsuit, at the beach. The demonstration unfolded at the Pedocin Beach Resort, renowned for its distinct separation of men's and women's sections a tradition originating from the early 20th century. A distinctive wall, rare among European beaches, symbolizes this segregation. During this event, male journalists and photographers crossed the wall to capture the protests within the women's section, which included participation from Muslim women. A week earlier, local beachgoers had voiced concerns about Muslim women's attire, accusing them of wearing unhygienic clothing. 
during Sunday's protest, demonstrators held banners with slogans such as, quote, which is more polluting, a dress or a cruise ship? During the demonstration, participants fully dressed entered the water and formed a sizable circle of reconciliation. The demonstration was an independent grassroots effort organized mainly through social media without the backing of associations or political parties. However, some from the men's and women's sections criticized the demonstrators, resorting to sexist and racist language. Nura Omar, the vice president of Trieste's Islamic Cultural Association, denounced the criticism faced by the Muslim women as discriminatory. She highlighted the importance of personal choice in clothing. On the other hand, Marco Driosto, a senator and coordinator of the right-wing League Party in Trieste, dismissed the protest as ineffective. On the eve of the sixth anniversary of the Rohingya exodus from Myanmar, human rights defenders have renewed calls for granting full rights to the persecuted community. Zor Win from human rights group Fortify Rights says Rohingya are citizens of the country and should be seen by fellow citizens as valued members of the pro-democratic revolution. Nearly 1.2 million Rohingya live in Bangladesh, the majority of whom fled a brutal military crackdown in Myanmar's Rakhine state in August 2017. While most of them remain in overcrowded camps in the Southern Cox's Bazaar district, approximately 30,000 have been relocated to Basan Chao Islet since late 2020. Wynne says six years since the persecution started, the Myanmar junta continues to create conditions to destroy Rohingya and erase their identity. The Fortify Rights Group says the Myanmar junta is coercing Rohingya to accept the national verification card that identifies Rohingya as foreigners. Myanmar is facing a case of genocide at the International Court of Justice filed by the Gambia. The junta administration is set to file its response in the International Court at The Hague. Thank you for watching. Our news is produced by Sound Vision, which is a not-for-profit organization. We need your support for donations. Please scan the QR code on our broadcast or visit muslimnetwork.tv to donate now so we can continue to amplify the voices of Muslims in Canada and abroad.